All right, Pat, welcome to the Pulling Focus podcast. We're really excited to have you on as a guest. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this one just from what I know about your organization and the story. It's very, very impactful. So I'd love a quick introduction of who you are and uh, the organization you represent. Sure. I'm Pat Nelly, and I'm the CEO of Children's Flight of Hope. We are an organization that's always been headquartered here on the Triangle, uh, but we serve children across the country and even internationally and provide them with air transportation to specialized medical care. So a lot of people know what Ronald McDonald House is. Think Ronald McDonald House of the air, and that's who we are. Fantastic. So when was it founded? How long have y'all been doing um, this? Or have there been any kind of changes in the organization over the past couple of years? Or has it been the same thing? Great question. So we were founded actually right down the street in Durham. Oh, cool. There was a young girl who had a car accident, needed to get to specialized care. Somebody with the plane said, I'll take her. And that was where the concept was founded. So uh, we became a 501c3, a nonprofit, soon thereafter. And for many years, it was a small group of pilots who flew children from this area, very regional, actually very triangle focused, mm -hmm. and then it grew from there. Um, we had our own plane for a while, wow. found that to be expensive, in for maintenance, can't rely on when you have it, and it's also very geographically limiting. So in about 2014, we switched from more of a private flight model to more of a commercial flight model, just knowing that resources could go a lot further on commercial flights and we could serve many, many more children that way. So in 2016 was a real pivotal year for us. We entered into a partnership with American Airlines. Mm -hmm. um, they had an international program where they would fly children internationally to United States hospitals. And they basically gave us the program and said, we're going to give you miles to serve international children. And that was when our volume and our awareness really started growing. Um, so we did 500 flights in 2019. Uh, we had a really good year in 20, uh, I'm sorry, 500 flights in 2016, mm -hmm. really good year in 2019. And then we all know what happened after that. Uh, we had a couple of years of COVID impact. Um, certainly people were hesitant to travel on, you know, for air travel, especially parents with who had sick children. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our children fly to hospitals that were considered, you know, COVID kind of war zones, New York mm -hmm. City, Boston. And so there was an impact of their um, them getting care. Their their providers had to find workarounds in their local community. So 2022, we rebounded and matched the number of 2019, which was 1,330 flights last year. Wow. And this year, we're soaring past that. So uh, we still have an international program. It's only about 20% of our flights, and we still do that courtesy of American Airlines. Um, but we're growing significantly. It's an exciting time for Children's Flight of Hope. That's fantastic. And thank you for the timeline there as well. Um, it seems like I'm guessing you've gotten to experience a lot and gotten to see a lot of really awesome things happen um, with the organization. How did it start? Like whose idea? I know you said yeah. there was the one one person and but how did the organization come about? So there have been obviously some key leaders involved over the years. There were a group of pilots, some of a couple of their names I'm familiar with. Matter of fact, we have a big event every fall and we give awards out in, in two of the founders' names. Mm -hmm. um, but it evolved from there. We had a gentleman, um, his name is Abel. Abel and his wife were really pivotal to putting more structure around the organization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, there's a lot of organizations that have great stories and great impact, but you have to, you have to look at a nonprofit as a little bit of, it has to be a business, right? Mm -hmm. You have to get word out and you have to have the funds and you have to, even though you're a nonprofit and, and you keep the, the children we serve are at the heart of everything we do, we had to have structure. And so Abel and his wife and really Abel really started that in the mid, you know, right around that time when we switched to commercial. Mm -hmm. And that was a big decision for the organization. There were people who had a hard time with, with letting go of that private flight model mm -hmm. and selling our plane. Um, and some really, you know, forward thinking people, um, uh, pushed that agenda through and it, and in hindsight, I think it was the right one. Uh, we have, we have a very active and committed board of directors. 
there are some board members who have been involved for a very long time. Um, three of them in particular. I don't know if, if we if we call people out by names or not. You're um, welcome to if you want to. So Rick Gardner, Deborah Nunn, and Jen Wade have been really the heart of our board of directors for a long time. What's exciting now is we've continued that program of really putting structure around everything we do. Mm -hmm. So we now have... Um, a better process to bring on the new wave of leadership mm -hmm. and we have better term limits and that kind of thing so those founders are, are not they're not founders but they were they were game changers um, they can look at the organization and take a lot of pride in where we are today and they can now move into more of an advisor role and a continued donor and let a new wave of leadership take over um, I started just before COVID mm -hmm. I have a long history in, in nonprofit, mostly in the development side of nonprofit. And it was an exciting opportunity for me, too, to bring my experience and my knowledge and my network to Children's Flight of Hope. And together with the board and bringing some key staff members on, we've really grown. Uh, just this week, I reached out to, to a company that I had a little bit of interaction with maybe five years ago. And one of the higher level executives responded and said, we've been watching the progress of Children's Flight of Hope for a few years now, wow. and it's an amazing organization, and, and we would like to get more involved. So we're, we're very proud of the level of awareness that has grown. There's so much more work to do, uh, but I think just like 2014 was a pivotal time for the organization, I think we're in another pivotal time. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, it's, I mean, the way we got connected was I saw something on online or LinkedIn and folks posting about an, an event they had gone to or mm -hmm. something like that. But um, just from looking at the website and hearing the timeline from your perspective, the, the growth is uh, is definitely evident. And we had another guest on who actually started um, right before COVID, uh, Krista from First Flight Venture Center. Actually, she started like right when COVID started. And she had a pretty unique perspective of coming into a new organization right as that was happening. I'm curious from um, from your point of view, like what, what was challenging about that? Or I'm sure there was a lot challenging. Was there anything like rewarding or, or did that help you kind of see things differently? Um, well, there were curious. a few aspects of COVID that um, – you know, that, that affected us. Of course, like I said, the volume was down. This, the year before that in 2019, we were doing about 120 flights a month in our, in our good months. In April of 2020, we provided two flights. Uh, wow. So yeah. we had to work hard to, to rebound from that. And a lot of it was out of our control. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly the international flights stopped. Borders were closed. Um, and we worked with families to help them try to find alternatives. And of course, the healthcare partners were you know, doing telehealth, and sometimes clinical trials may have loosened their restrictions a little bit so that um, kids didn't have to try to travel for care. But it was a challenging time for sure. Mm -hmm. And we jumped into a task force mode instead of a board of directors mode mm -hmm. and had people really working on how were we going to survive this because we knew nonprofits were, were struggling. Um, and it actually turned out to be a, I mean, you hate to use any positive word associated sure. with COVID, right? But it gave us time to do some of this work of building a stronger foundation so mm -hmm. that we could grow capacity. And we have been very blessed with an amazing community of supporters, and they stayed strong for us. So we actually came out of COVID with a better organization structure, better processes, um, a lot of impactful conversations have mm -hmm. hap had happened and a little more money sure. in the bank. Yeah. Um, so it was actually, you know, it was, it was a good time from a, for us from an organization standpoint. Of course, you know, the, the worst part of it was we weren't flying the same number of children, which is our ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, but we're back strong. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting, like organizations having that time to take a step back mm -hmm. and kind of look at themselves internally. And I'm sure as a nonprofit, a lot of the focus is, I mean, you're constantly going. From what I know about nonprofits, they're very busy. Um, but yeah, that um, there is like a silver lining there, and now things are are back to normal. And I'm sure like um, it's only it's only uh, upward and, and right from here. So, what are some of the more impactful stories you've experienced, uh -huh. <laughs> or like, are there a few that just if you were to say 
one, um, you know, one or two uh, stories from your time. Sure. Or, you know, and we, we always talk about the data because the data matters to mm-hmm. the donors, right? How many flights, how many new families, those kind of things. But the stories are are what really drives us. Mm-hmm. Um, the words of need, the words of gratitude that we get from the families, they're humbling and they're very motivating. You know, are you a parent? Not a parent. So I'm a parent and people always say you're not supposed to have your favorite, but most of us do, <laughs> sure. right? Um, it sometimes it's it's uh, it varies on who your favorite is, but I'll, I'll share two of my, I'll put favorites in quotation mm-hmm. marks. There's a young boy in Chapel Hill who was born in India, Mm -hmm. had a very, very rare disease. Uh, It's, we'll shorten it, we'll call it EB. Mm -hmm. That's what you, the the scientific name never comes out of my mouth the correct way. So we'll go with EB. EB is a very serious skin disorder, Mm. um, such that any friction to this young boy's skin causes his skin to blister, shear off. So he is bandaged from neck to toe Mm -hmm. every day. And he was born to a loving family in India who couldn't care for him, put him in an orphanage. And there was a single woman in Chapel Hill who had gotten, had some experience with this disease and had decided this was going to be her, her purpose. Mm. And she went to India and adopted this young child, brought him home to Chapel Hill, where he has a phenomenal team of physicians in Chapel Hill. But he travels with us, uh, usually to Cincinnati Children's Hospital for specialized care. And what's really incredible about his story is he has another genetic disorder such that his blood doesn't clot properly. So Mm. imagine having this issue with your skin. And that same issue actually affects his internal organs, too. I won't share the details of that as much. But he's tube fed because he can't end up the abrasion to his his digestive system, his esophagus, all of that. Um, but he has another disorder that makes his blood not clot. So those two in, con- in combination, um, he is thought to be the only child in the world with this combination of genetic disorders. And that right there is, is the core of what we do. We don't fly children who can get care in their local community. Yeah, These kids have such a rare and complex disease that doctors in their, in their hometown, home state, have likely never seen it, mm-hmm. certainly never treated it. So that is the core. It's, we provide flights to specialized medical care. The other child um, that I've had the pleasure of meeting, she actually lives in Wisconsin and flies from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in, in New York City. She has retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma is eye cancer. It only affects about 300 kids in the United States a year. And worldwide, the death rate for retinoblastoma is 50%. Wow. If you're in this clinic with this doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering, the survival rate is 95, 99%. Wow. It, it's astounding, the difference. And so um, this little girl, Julia, is has a, we say she has the dubious honor of being our most frequent flyer. She's flown with us 108 times, and she's eight years old. Wow. So that's the other thing that's special about us is we fly these kids – the child and a parent or guardian for the duration of the healthcare journey as many times as it takes, as many miles as it takes through the age 18. And, you know, a few minutes ago, I mentioned the numbers of the kids we serve. We only report the children's flights. So last year when we provided 1,330 flights, it was actually 2,660 flights because sure. we provide the flight for the parent mm-hmm. too. Um, but that's a, that's a bonus. It's not the yeah. core of what we do, right? We're children's flight of hope. Wow, those are some uh, phenomenal stories, and just the the amount of times that, like the second the second patient, the second child, um, that that's that's incredible. I mean, that's a lot of flights. Well, it's a lot of th- flights, and it's you know you think about the financial yeah. burden to these families, and the families we we serve do have financial need, but it's it's so much more than that because Julia's parents know that travel is not something they ever have to worry about in a long list of other worries that they have, right? Our process is pretty smooth. They basically tell us, I'm flying August 2nd. We send them flight options. Mm -hmm. They tell us what they want. We book it. Mm -hmm. They need a flight change. We take care of the change for them. They need TSA CARES assistance. We help them with TSA CARE. So we really do try to not just ease that that financial burden and, and give a better health outcome, but we want to ease the emotional burden to these families as well. Yeah, I'm sure that the last thing they want to be thinking about is how to get to the care. 
um, cause it already is enough stress and right. anxiety and worry. And, um, that's, that's pretty phenomenal. I, I, I wonder, is there anything that you wish people knew about your organization that they might not know? A lot of things. Um, I would like them to know that this is our currently our only office. Um, we are headquartered and do everything from here. Um, I think the long-term vision is for us to, to have um, a different model for mm-hmm. that. But up until six months ago, we had three people on staff. Wow. We have five and a half right now. Well, actually a year ago, because a year ago we hired a chief operating officer, which was a huge help to the organization, again, with that process and procedures. Um, It also gave me more time to do other bigger vision, bigger conversation things. Um, And now with the flight volume we have for the first time in our history, we have two two women booking flights for families. Gotcha. So... um, that we are the only chapter and we're doing amazing work um, from here. We serve kids across the country, like I said, internationally with American. About 20% of our kids come from North Carolina, though mm-hmm. North Carolina is um, the core of our organization. Um, I think families or, or people should know that you know we are a nonprofit. We, yeah. we provide all of these flights through the kindness of other people. Um, you know, we are working hard to establish relationships with more airlines, Mm -hmm. but generally we book a flight same as you do. Yeah. You know, other than American Airlines, which we book with miles, I mean, we go on and we sell family, whether we've got a good option on Delta or United or, Mm -hmm. or, you know, another airline and they tell us what they want. So is there any, we've, we've talked to a lot of people from the Raleigh area uh, in the triangle. Is there any benefit that you've experienced from being based here and having the the headquarters here in, uh, are you in Raleigh or Durham? We're in Raleigh. Raleigh. We were, we were originally, I think we were originally in Cary. Um, we've always been in the triangle. Um, I think because we have always had our focus here over three decades, there is an incredible core group of donors that have moved the needle and feel this organization so passionately. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, our job is to share our story, bring people into the story, and then have them want to stay here. Mm -hmm. Our story is a pretty compelling one. um, And we are very, very fortunate that we have such an amazing community driving this mission forward. Um, I think that people think about... (laughs) The local people think about the triangle and think about, we've got great health care right here. Yeah. Just like I said, our local health care partners haven't seen everything. Sure. Right? We actually have the head of uh, pediatric cardiology at Duke on our board. Oh, cool. Amazing man with an amazing team sure. doing amazing life-saving care in, in that space. And he'll be the first to say, as amazing as Duke is, they can't be amazing at everything. Yeah, um, and I think that is an important message for everyone to understand: is that these these kids, like I said, they what they have. We are lucky enough that we've probably never heard of it. Sure, sure. Right, um, and there are people who fund important research, and there are a lot of nonprofit organizations who make that happen our families don't have that luxury, right? Yeah. They don't have the luxury of research and time. They need help now. Yeah. And so, you know, you talked about nonprofits are always busy, and, and we are. We have a small team. We're very passionate because we know we need to book that flight today. Sure. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, apart from, you know, financial contributions, what what is a good way for people to help and get involved if they're – you know, really believe in this mission and want, and want to be a part of it. Um, how, how can people help? There's all sorts of ways people can help. And obviously, as a nonprofit, the com- financial component is a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And no amount is, is too small. And of course, no amount is too big. We have a monthly giving campaign that, you know, I donate to. You can donate $5 a month to a mo- monthly giving campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, there are volunteer opportunities. We have three events a year that always need volunteers. Uh, there are we have a, you know incredible amount of corporate support. So invite your company to hear about it. Um, employee giving, workplace matching, um, but you know a key part for us is raising awareness. And, and most of us are on social media. Sure. And and you guys know how the algorithms work, mm-hmm. right? Like it, comment, share it. Those are the things that raise awareness, so that we can 
not just raise more funds, but reach more families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, um, you know, attendance at our events is another, you know, obvious way. Board service, if anybody is listening, um, you know, we have um, very, uh, a wonderful board and we have very uh, defined hopes for what we want to accomplish and we want to bring board members in, around the table. It will help to, us reach those goals. Sure. We have committees that we invite non-board members to sit on. There are, there are many ways to get involved. The unfortunate thing for us is that we don't, we're not an organization that's hands-on with our families. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're not where you can go sort food or play games with children or that kind sure. of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and a lot of people get pulled in when they can be face to face with the organization. Um, we just don't have that level of interaction with our families. But there's a lot of magic happening behind the scenes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Have you all found any opportunities to partner with other nonprofits or um, like any interesting partnerships with uh, companies locally? We have some great nonprofit partners and some great companies um, involved. Um, it's interesting because this little boy I was telling you um, about in Chapel Hill, his mother used to be a social worker at a school, and now she actually works for a nonprofit that connects cancer families in North and South Carolina to resources. Oh, cool. So she yeah. sends a lot of children to us, yeah. which is phenomenal. Um, we have a nonprofit partner actually in Denver that predominantly does private flights that we share client information to um, with them. Uh, you know, we've I, I chat with the leadership at, at Ronald McDonald House, mm -hmm. right? That's a perfect alignment mm -hmm. for us. So we are, every partner is a good possible partner for us, right? We, we're all trying to lift up the human experience. Um, Corporately, we are very, very fortunate to have many companies involved with our with our organization. A key one is KAC Pharmaceuticals in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, last year, we launched a new campaign called our Champion of Hope sponsor, and KAC was the first company to step up with that awesome. level of commitment. And basically, KAC doesn't just sponsor our golf tournament or our or our big fundraiser, mm -hmm. our, our for, more formal fundraiser. They sponsor. At, our, our entire year of support. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a growing initiative for us. Um, we just got a grant from Duke. Uh, we have we have quite a lot. I mean, I, I should know that number. I couldn't even, we had 40, we just had a golf tournament. We had 41 teams, wow. all, you know, corporate teams there. Um, we have other events coming up with corporate support. And we're very lucky that the, the corporate community and the personal community really drives our mission forward. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I hope that this podcast hopefully can connect yeah. a few more people with I would what love you it. have going on. I would love it. Um, but yeah, that, that leads me to my, my last question that I ask everyone is what is next uh, with the nonprofit and, and what's exciting in the next six months to 12 months? You got it. Can, can I give you two answers? Of course, as many <laughs> as you want. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, you know, we do have events and on September 16th, we have a very fun one and I think a very unique one in our market. So we uh, are this campaign kicked off a few weeks ago and it pairs local breweries with local companies and they partner over the summer to create their own signature brew and to fundraise for us. And on September 16th, it's called Hops for Hope. We gather um, at the North Hills Park right there mm -hmm. behind Chewy's. The big green space. The big green space. Yeah, yeah. All of those companies, um, teams this year, there's 31 of them, have booths set up around that green space. You buy tickets, you come, you get a tasting glass, mm -hmm. and you can go to as many of those booths as you want to and try their beer flavor. Mm -hmm. um, we recommend you use Uber. Um, or Lyft or some other safe form of transportation. Um, and you can not only taste all the beers, but it's family friendly. There's a band, there's a kid zone, it's pet friendly. There are beer critics who give the beer um, critics award oh, wow. for the best yeah. flavor. There's voting by the by the fans for the people's choice award. Uh, we give awards for the best, best booth display. Um, this event actually started in 2016 
at Cap Trust. Oh, yeah. They launched Hops for Hope for Us the first year. It was at Tirnanog, which doesn't even exist anymore, and it raised $14,000. And last year, the event raised um, over $410,000. Wow. So it is a really exciting, fun, growing event. Um, we have lots of sponsors for it, lots of teams participating, and tickets are on sale um, through our website. And, and Hops for Hope has its own uh, social media handle, Hops okay. for Hope. You can go to Hops for Hope and, and find out how to buy tickets. And, of course, always encourage everybody to, to follow us at Children's Flight of Hope as well on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and all the ticket sale information is there. It's fun. It's sounds, a lot of fun. Last year we yeah. had a bad weather day and it started raining pre- pretty heavily for the second half of the event and um, we had a hard time. We were we were drenched and miserable and people were still having fun. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we're going to be uh, tackling a very exciting initiative with the organization. Um, we just recently got together and said, what's our, what's our big, amazing goal for 10 years? Where do we want to be? And then brought it closer to home with a three-year goal and a one-year action plan. We know Children's Flight of Hope can be so much more. Mm-hmm. We want to be and need to be a nationally known organization because that is where our children are coming from, is sure. across this country. So buckle your seatbelt because Children's Flight of Hope is, is going places. Wow. Well, that's so exciting. Um, we've talked a, a little bit about where you can find more information about Ch- Children's Flight of Hope on uh, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as the Hops for Hope event. And, coming and, our, and our main website, childrensflightofhope.org. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us on the podcast. This has been uh, really exciting. I'm personally excited to see where the organization goes and, and as the impact uh, grows with the, the organization. So thank you again for your time today. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I always love sharing our story. Awesome.